looks like you're going to get on the wall and talk about something. I'll wait. All right. So in our last exciting episode, we talked about how um, the PCC network, always under constant attack, had succumbed to some sort of hack <coughs> on this little facility right here. Um, the latest news is that when you use this facility in the second part of your form exercise, you will imitate this form here. You will create a web page that's running on sws.pcc.edu and it'll imitate this form. And you'll use the documentation for this facility to figure out how to make your own form. When your form does its thing, um, we should get this page where you'll see the result of the form. That's what they tell me. I haven't tried this out yet. At that point, you'll be able to see that um, whatever fields you created and whatever values they had was received by the server. <coughs> if that's the case, then we know that your form is working. Um, and that if this thing were allowed to send email, it would. They're still going to keep the email part of it turned off. So this thing won't send email. The way I normally grade this thing is I just go to your form and I fill it out and I look for email to arrive in my inbox. And if everything's working, it works. I get email. This time I'm going to have to actually go watch the thing operate. I may have to actually go look at your code, look at your page to make sure that it's working because there's not going to be any email. Unless they get it fixed this weekend. Um, let's see if they got it fixed. Maybe it's actually working. Nope. So it's not sending email. So we'll just uh, deal with it as far as we can. So, hi. So here's the documentation for this uh, particular feature. And the thing I want to call your attention to is there's a particular, let's see, let's go back here. Here's the form. Let's view the source of this form. What gibberish? Oh my goodness. Here's the form. Here's the form. Here's, uh, we'll talk about this tag in the second half of today's class. Here's the form, and it's posting a message to this particular place. And this is the, you can tell it's a Perl script. This is the Perl script that is sending email for us. Send yourself a message. Da, da, da. Here's the tricky part. This is the name of the person who's supposed to get email. This name of this input is recipient. And you send it the, um, you fill it in with an email address. And this form is designed to use that particular field and to send email. You have to get that right. The old form that you start with has a different action uses different fields here. So I'm laying down these broad hints for you guys. And this is what um, software engineering is mostly about, frankly, is you get a piece of code that someone else wrote or someone else um, used, that used to be working and is now broken. And you need to adapt a new piece of code. You have to figure out what pieces do I have to change for this new piece of code to do what I want it to do. So I'll just leave you some big, broad, look here kind of markers. The first trick in any of these situations is to figure out how does this work? And then the next trick is what do I change? Because if you, if you can get away with changing just a little piece, then you win. If you have to change a lot of stuff, you might as well write it from scratch. So that's, that's the thing. We'll come back around and we'll talk about the form. 
and we'll talk about the uh, input tag and how the various form inputs work. We'll talk about uh, different input types, text types. We'll talk about the submit button. And uh, all of this stuff will be easy peasy by the time we're done. So that's uh, a little preview. Let's switch back to the network presentation that we were working on. I'm going to try and breeze through this pretty quickly. This is available to you on the uh, course materials. Uh, those of you who went through CIS 120 and kept your textbook can read this chapter. Um, it's the same stuff. And then we'll switch to the home network. And then we'll take a break. Or we actually make it breaks in between. I like breaks. More breaks. So in our last exciting episode, we were talking about RFID tags and how those were basically little passive radios that when you ping them, they, they said, hi, my number is so-and-so. The neat thing about them is that they didn't require batteries. You could have them in little pieces of paper. You could have them in little chips in, a, in, a, in an animal's neck. It's very cool. Um, let's talk about other kinds of wireless protocols. Who here has a clear network card? Is anyone a clear subscriber? You are? How do you like it? hate it. You hate it? it why? It keeps on going in and out. It's not very reliable? Clear is, uh, is clear YMAX? I think it is. I think so. Yeah. So that's a wireless standard. Remember the, the Wi-Fi standard we talked about last time was 802.11, 802.11. 802.16 is WiMAX. It's one of those things where they used to implement a metropolitan area network. I'm not sure. It's been around for a couple of years now. I'm not sure it's going to last very long because the cell phone networks are getting faster and faster. If you can have a cell phone that goes just as fast as WiMAX, why would you have WiMAX? Uh, cell phone networks are rolling out a little slower than they expected. They thought they would be at 4G. I think when I was looking into this, when I worked in this industry, they thought they were going to be at 4G, I don't know, eight years ago, something like that. Didn't work out. It's always hard to change infrastructure. They kind of did a half-way measure called it 4G LTE. Now they're rolling that out. But it'll be eventually they'll have 4G and it'll be nice and fast and we won't need one that's gone. What you find more often is this wireless application protocol. If you've uh, ever set up a uh, wireless NIC on your own machine, it'll ask you, should I use uh, WEP, should I use WPA? These are all aspects of wireless application protocol. Uh, we'll pass that. Does anyone here have a landline at home? Why? Oh, yeah, no, no cell phone for me. I see. Yeah? How about you? I take care of my mom, so she needs a second phone. All right. Sounds good. Sometimes people still have fax machines. They use the landline for that. I can go through the internet. You go, yeah, so do I. I have a fax service that I use. Um, sometimes they used to call this the POTS network, the plain old, television, uh, plain old telephone system. But the more formal name is the uh, public switch telephone. It used to be that all of these networks were analog. That um, when you picked up the phone, a, a relay somewhere would close, and there was actually an electrical connection all the way from your telephone to the person you were talking to. And the switches that they were talking about were actual mechanical switches, and they would. You, it was wonderful. If you ever went inside of one of these switching stations, you would hear them all clicking. It'd be like millions of crickets. You'd be among millions of crickets. And they all had little sparks as they connected and disconnected. So it was like being in the middle of all these sparkly little crickets. It was wonderful. Um, that's all gone now. Everything uh, that we do, very rarely, is anything analog. Analog meaning it's a direct connection and it's the varying signal that carries, it's the varying voltage that carries the signal. Now everything is a data network. Packets are moving everywhere. 
And that's true for your phones as well. Only the last foot or two used to be analog, the, from the, the pole outside to your, um, to your house. They called that the last mile problem, where there are all these analog wires in the people's houses. These days, especially if you have an internet-based phone like Vonage or Comcast, it's all digital all the way to the handset. Your cell phone is certainly digital all the way to the handset. Um, there's different kinds of connectivity you can buy if your internet service provider. If you're a business, it used to be T1s with a hot setup. I can still remember when you would actually have to pay lots of money to get any kind of decent bandwidth at all. These days, everybody gets this kind of bandwidth. And in other countries, they get it cheap, like Korea. Most everybody gets 10 and 20 and 30 uh, megabits download for what we pay for just entry level stuff. We already talked last week that most of us don't use dial up anymore. In fact, I don't even have a motor on any of my machines um, anymore. Um, and that little song you used to hear whenever you connected up, never, but never going to hear that again. So most of us these days are using either DSL or cable. And you basically get what you pay for there. It's a regulated monopoly. Um, that, again, that last mile, we can't have a million people come and stream wires to your house. But with the way the governments regulate these utilities, it's not really that much of a benefit. But we'll leave the politics out of it. The big problem with networking is the infrastructure always has to get replaced. So they lay a lot of wires, they lay a lot of fiber optics, and then they increase the technology, and they have to remove all the old stuff. So you'll see in other countries in the world, especially countries that developed their phone network after we did, they're better than we are. Again, Korea or the many Asian nations. Even in Africa, where all of the networks are wireless, they can upgrade much faster than we can because they don't have the old infrastructure that they have to replace. Most of these things are asymmetric. Asymmetric, asymmetric. Meaning, it's much faster coming down than it is going up. Uh, let's see. Let's see if you can go straight back. So let's see what our download speed is here. So how do you test download speed? You get a big file and you just download it. You count the number of bytes, you count the number of seconds it takes, and that tells you bytes per second, bits per second. Now PCC buys a lot of bandwidth. So strangely enough, we have better upload speed than download speed. Now how could that be? I don't know. There's a lot of factors that you can't tell just by looking at this screen. But it may be that a lot of people are downloading and our particular share of the bandwidth is pretty small. At home, you should try this out, speakeasy.net, and see if you're getting the same kind of bandwidth that you're paying for. I think I pay for about 10 megabit down, and I typically get 16, at least for the first couple of kilobytes, and then it drops down below 10. Comcast has this way of giving you really good bandwidth for the first few uh, kilobytes so that most web pages go really fast. Um, and then they basically throttle it down to where you're paying for it. And they really make you pay for stuff. So there's a different bandwidth coming down than there is going up. Usually, it's faster coming down than going up in a residential situation. Because most of us are, are consumers of data rather than of data. If you're a data center, if you're the kind of data center where you're hosting a lot of web pages, the situation is just reversed. The request for a web page is only a couple hundred bytes. 
it's a, it's a simple little request. It's the URL, it's a bunch of verbs, some data about the browser. And then there's all that data that comes back down the web page, the video, the images, all that sort of stuff. So if you're an IT department and you're serving data, you have a different kind of contract than if you're a residential house and you're receiving data. The last thing about that in terms of uh, when you're buying networks, you rarely find a big company that has just one connection to the network, one connection to the internet. At Tektronix, we always had two, and they always went through different providers. So if AT&T had problems, we could route through Sprint. A large company have many connections to the internet, and an even larger company like uh, Google or Yahoo or any of these large vendors use what's called a content delivery network. That's where they have servers all over the planet, literally all over the planet. And then they distribute the same content to those servers and then when you ask for something from www.google.com, they route your traffic to the nearest set of servers, or the least loaded set of servers. So if you have a very high bandwidth application or you've got a very popular website, you typically use a content delivery network and you have many, many, many connections to the network. It's all about bandwidth. How do we measure bandwidth? What's the... Uh, What's the measure for bandwidth? Megabits. Megabits per second. So it's how many bits of data go through the pipe every second. There's another side of it called latency. Latency. Does anyone know what latency is? Chris? It's the amount of time or the, basically the connection between you and the way you're talking to and yep. the time it takes for you to communicate. Yep. How fast, if you just say, just a, a ping is a, a very simple transaction. It's, are you there? And then the device you ask that says, yes, I'm there. It's 64 bytes, if you, not less. So the question is, how fast does that transmit through? So let's get a little wonky here, if you don't mind. And once again, I'm sorry I have to take the time to make it readable for you. There you go. Screen buffer, screen width. So the ping command is just send a bunch of data, 32 bytes of data, to a particular address, and then the whoever you're pinging will send back a couple of bytes that says, yeah, I got it. It basically just verifies that the connection is there. The turnaround time in Tektronix is very quick. They're in Beaverton, but the traffic probably goes, well, let's see where the traffic goes. Trace route, is it trace route? RT. Now this is a command that says send me, send a simple packet to this destination tech.com, but tell me where it goes. So all the way along the line, all the little bits of the network are going to report back. Yeah, I got that packet and I sent it forward. So it allows you to trace the route from this machine to the web server that Tektronix is using for tech.com. Very likely not, well it may be, Tech used to host their actual domain on their servers in Beaverton. I'd be very surprised if they still do. Um, but here you can see that our machine is 10.30.143.1, that's our PC, or at least, no, no, it's the gateway from our PC to its local. And then there's another machine, and then there's another machine, and another machine, and another machine. And then we get out to TWTelecom.net, which is a uh, service provider.
goes to another one of their machines, and then finally it gets to TechDown. So you can see it has passed through a number of devices. These might be computers, these might be routers or gateways, who knows. Each time it has only taken less than a millisecond or maybe two or three milliseconds to get from one piece of the network to the next. And then coming back around, um, it came all the way back, the last time we asked for it, it came all the way back around in nine milliseconds. Some of these things are much slower. Let's see, if we do a ping, now not everybody accepts BBC, that's CO, CO, UK. Not everybody accepts uh, ping requests. It's an old way of doing a denial of service attack on somebody, it's just hitting them with a lot of pings. But here's a server that is very likely somewhere in Europe. It's the uh, BBC and it's got a, a United Kingdom address. It's 215 milliseconds. Now I'm sure the BBC has just the same strength of servers and just as fast a network as Tektronix does. Probably better. Why does it take so long for the packet to go to England and back? Distance cover travels. Okay, so it's a further distance, and what's the limiting factor? There's only some data that can get through the not, I mean, the transatlantic. Uh, okay, so there's only so much bandwidth. Oh. Yeah, there's only so much bandwidth between here and there. But the speed of light is the thing that's really limiting us. Because this isn't a big transaction. It's only 32 bytes. So the bandwidth isn't the problem. It's just the distance. It takes electricity that long to go to the other side of the planet and back. It would be also the line of sight. Well, that's interesting. Because um, it used to be that we thought everything was going to be on satellite. And if you look at the surface of the world, um, What's the geostationary orbit distance? 25,000 miles, something like that. So a little satellite's way up here. And if I'm over here, and I want to get to there, I have to pulse all the way up to here and then come all the way down. That's actually about two and a half to three seconds round, distance, uh, round trip. The speed of light, if you, if you shined a laser and bounced it off a mirror, had it actually hit um, Britain, it would take three seconds for that laser pulse to go out and come back. It's a long way. It's a very long way. These days, we have laid so much fiber optic cable. We have laid all sorts, thousands, thousands of fiber optic cables across the Atlantic. This distance is actually much smaller. It's only 0.2 seconds to get from here and back. The geo, the geological, just the distance, is very short. The other thing in terms of what you were saying, this is a limited bandwidth thing. There's only so many of those cables on the ocean floor. But the bandwidth up to a satellite and back is much, much lower. Much, much lower. And it's much more expensive. To keep a satellite in orbit is much more expensive. So anyway. get back to where we were. So you can see a couple of different things. In the conversation between this PC and some server somewhere, a couple things are happening to review. Number one, all of these guys have IP addresses. We don't know any of the names of these servers and it's not important. The packets are being routed by numbers alone. The second thing is bandwidth is important. We saw that there's at least a PCC, there's probably nine megabits down and 18 megabits up. In fact, I bring you know, the, the YouTube videos I record for this class, I always upload them here. Because if I upload them from my house, they're HD videos, it takes 12 hours. And usually it fails. Here, it's 20 minutes. Sucks it right. The second thing is latency, is the time it takes for a transaction to go from one and then back. Latency is how long does it take to do a transaction. And that is usually very short if it's somewhere in the continental United States to a, a, uh, a 
incredibly large company, but it's limited by the speed of light. That's another reason why Google and all the big providers put data centers on different parts of the globe, because they want to have their data centers physically close to you, so the speed of light isn't a factor anymore. If you buy bandwidth from Amazon, if you buy a machine on the cloud from Amazon, you tell it, I want you to, I want you to make this machine in Europe. I want this machine to show up in Japan. And they'll provision a server for you wherever you want on the planet. It's like living in the future. And now it's actually free for certain people. Amazon is free for certain people? For one year. Wow, that is so cool. It was slick deals like about a month ago. That is very cool. I can't tell you, it doesn't really matter. Um, I can't tell you what a heartache it used to be to get a machine going. When we wanted to bring a new service online at our company, um, we'd have to go spec the machine. Some would actually have to go buy the hardware. They'd have to ship it to us. They'd have to assign a person to bring it up. It would take literally months and thousands and thousands of dollars for the simplest little server. Those days are gone. They're just gone. These days, you type in a command, and you've got a server wherever you want it, and <laughs> apparently you can do it for free. It's just a crazy world we're in. That's the other thing I love about this line of work, is every time you think to yourself, oh, I wish they could do this, you know, I wish they had this kind of technology, they will. They will. We're going to move pretty quickly here. Let's talk about what you'll actually find in your house. The connection between your digital network and the communication channel that you're using, in this case, the, the switch, <coughs> the telephone network, or the cable network, is called a modem. That stands for modulator, demodulator. Modulator, demodulator. Modulation is just the process of taking one signal and laying it on top of the other one. So if they want to take your digital signal they got to boost it up to these really high radio frequencies and ship it out across the cable network. They use a modem to do that. Your phone, like we talked about last time, has three modems in it, one for each radio channel that it works on. So a modem typically has an input and an output. It has a cable network. These are coaxial cable connectors. You guys are familiar with that. They carry radio frequency signals. And this is your typical Ethernet connector. That's called a Cat5 connector. They're all over this room if you haven't seen one before. Um, yeah. Um, it's okay. Slight correction. It's an RJ45 connector. RJ45 for a Cat5 cable. Well, because it's, it's no longer just Cat5, it's Cat5, Cat5e, Cat6. Very cool. So what's the actual name of the thing? RJ45. Very good. It looks like an old phone connector, but it's not. It has a different number of connectors on it. You would think that they would have designed it enough differently that people couldn't stick the wrong connector in it, but it, people still do. Sometimes you don't actually hook up to the <coughs> cable itself. Like we talked about on your clear network, they gave you a little modem that you plug into your laptop. Or if you're using your um, you're using your phone as a modem, um, these days the phone will talk to the cell phone network using one modem, and then will talk to your wireless network using a different modem, and then your laptop will just talk to the phone using <coughs> the wireless network. We talked about NICs. What does NICs stand for? NIC network interface. Do, 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 do. Now the next thing you will probably find in your what they call a router at your house. Let's take a look at it. And on your assignments, please show me all of these pieces. So you'll have a network connection in your house. Let's say in my case it's from cable. And then there's a modem. So here it's radio frequencies on this side, radio, radio, and here it's digital, digital network. 
That's what the modem does. The next thing you see here, and this is again a simplified view of things, is a router. <clears throat> then you'll see a um, firewall. Sometimes you'll see a switch. It's a switch. And then you'll see a wireless access point. All of these things will be bundled up into what they call a router, like a Linksys router. And you'll see that they'll have a little antenna, or sometimes you'll see two antennas because it gives you better uh, resistance to interference. But inside that device are actually several components, and I would like you to show me all of them. If you have a router, that doesn't have a wireless access point, show me that. There's actually a different symbol in the assignment. There's a different symbol for showing me that there's a wireless access point than the router. So if we have a link to have cable version and everything goes out from it, mm -hmm. you want us to break that down into several components? You can show me the box, and you can either label it, this is my router and my firewall and my wireless access point, or you can uh, show me the different boxes Sometimes people, have, uh, students have actually, you know, gotten out the manual and gotten the block diagram for their particular router and showed me the block diagram for their router. It really doesn't matter. The important thing on these diagrams, if you give me a rectangle and says, this is a piece of my network, you have to tell me what that rectangle does. And your home router does a bunch of different things. For example, there's not only a wireless access point, typically there's also a DHCP server. If your house has a DHCP server, then you've got to show me that that's what's going on. That's a critical part of your network, and I want to see where it is. Some people have all of this stuff broken out. If you're, um, when I was a full-time Linux hacker, I had different machines doing all of this stuff. Now I've got it in a little box that probably cost me 20 bucks. Now, a route, yes, sir. Excuse me, Alex, what's, what's the last rectangle on the top? There's router. This, this is switch. I'll switch. I'll roll out. When I finish uh, showing you the diagram, we'll roll up the screen and we'll do the whole diagram. All right. Now, as uh, we talked about on Tuesday, a router is a device. The, the simplest kind of device that connects two networks is called a bridge. It's a simple bridge. A bridge is uh, the, the conceptual equivalent of just two wires connected together. It just passes packets back and forth. It doesn't try and do any kind of manipulation of those packets. Well, it does a bunch of manip manipulation, but let's keep it simple. A router, on the other hand, does other stuff. So, for example, we talked about in my network, in my house, Comcast has assigned me an IP address. I don't know what it is, but it's in the 20.25.19.7 range. So if you're looking at my house from the outside, you would use this address. 20.25.19, whatever. When I'm on the Comcast network, and they're going around and looking at all of the devices on their network, they use this address to find my house. And everything that's inside it. I've got a whole bunch of other, other devices inside my house, and they all have their own addresses. So the router is the thing that makes that translation. When I ask for a web page, my PC goes out and says, I want to go to, I don't know, 195, and blah, blah, blah. It goes out to sws.pcc.edu, finds out what the IP address is, and sends a packet. The router gets that packet and says, that address is not on my network. And it hands it off to Comcast. Now, the address on that packet is the address of my PC. You remember that every packet has a return address? So I'm sending out a little message that says, I want this web page. And when you get that web page, send it back to this address. What one of the many things that router does is it changes the addresses. So that as it sends it out, 
It'll now say, I want a web page and I want you to send it back to me. And when you send it back, I want you to send it to 20.25.19.7. So it's constantly translating the addresses as that packet moves from network to network and the numbers change. So that's one of the simplest things that a router does. But basically, remember it this way. A router connects two networks of similar protocols. One of the things that they call that is network address translation. NET, network address translation. It's also the most basic idea around firewalls. If someone comes and attacks my network and says, hey, you want, some, you want a data packet? You can trust me, I picked it up in the Navy. The firewall is going to say, no, nope, there's nobody around here by that name. In fact, most firewalls will just drop the packet. They'll just ignore it. Your machine is protected simply by having that, that little uh, router between you and the network that is looking out for packets that match your address. There's more to firewalls. We'll talk about that in a second. So, can I ask you a question? Yep. So, if you just have a cable modem, the cable modem works as the DHCP server. It depends. You may have a cable modem that does that, sure. So a cable modem is set up to talk from one network to, a, uh, to convert from analog to digital, and it typically is expecting to talk to one digital, one network device on the outside. So if you, don't, if you only have one PC at home, sure, you can connect your one PC to the cable modem. And as far as that PC is known, in fact, they'll probably set it up that way, this is the address of that PC. At that point, you have to depend on the PC's firewall to protect you. Because you don't have this router or a hardware firewall between you and the network. So, I mean, you can set up your um, system to go to the DHCP server, which you can have it go to the router, or I mean, the modem, mm -hmm. or you can have it go to the outside, which would take longer, right? Have it set up either yeah, way. depending on how you want to set it up. Typically, the LAN only has one DHCP server. I had a problem the other day. I was putting a, uh, I have a, I have a wireless access point, an old Apple Airport Extreme that is failing. And I reflashed it and I tried to get it working again. When it woke up, it said, oh, I'm the DHCP server on this network. And it started handing out bogus addresses. And all of our machines went dead. My son says, dead? What did you do to the network? In other families, they argue about cars. In our family, we argue about network addresses. So I have to fix my I thought a lot of the cable signals today would be Yep. Yep. They, in fact, Comcast just did that big switch. Right. But still, okay, so even then, even then, they call it digital cable. But even then, that coax to your house is still carrying radio frequency right. signals. And it is still encoded with an analog signal. So the television signal itself used to be an analog signal. Now that's gone. There's no more analog signals in the cable network. Then they had on um, the, the, through the airwaves television, they had um, an analog signal. And there they've transitioned away from that. But still, the big transmitter, the big TV transmitter, is still pumping out megawatts of analog energy. It's just modulating it differently. Okay. Okay, we have the Uh huh. And I was losing about 100 to 120 packets per second on the bedroom. And we couldn't figure out why. Uh huh. And couldn't find out the cable got bent in 90 degree. Yeah. And it stretched the wire, and that's where we were losing our packets at. So I just went out and the cable and ran. It's amazing, isn't it? We used to we used to debug bandwidth issues uh, in the IT department I worked in. And you roll your you roll your chair over a cable. And suddenly your bandwidth drops to zero. At, at some layer, everything's analog. At some layer, everything's analog, and a little kink in the cable will nail you. It's funny. Everybody says, oh, if it's digital, it must be, it must be error free. Yeah. OK. All right, let's keep moving. It's break time. Take a look at the, the animations that you'll see on Desire Learn. There's a, a demonstration of what's different between a hub and
and a switch. Basically, does anyone can anyone tell me the difference between a hub and a switch? Yes, sir. A hub is just kind of like we're talking here, and a switch is control packets or control supports. Yep. It's a very good analogy. When I say when I talk to you, everybody can hear. Me. If this were a switched environment, when I talk to him, it would seem like it was silent to you. You wouldn't hear anything that I was speaking specifically to him. A switch learns the addresses of everybody on the network. And after the first initial transfers, it never duplicates any traffic. It only sends traffic to the one place where those packets are intended to go. A hub, in contrast, is as if you just wired all the wires together. Everybody gets every packet. And most machines throw them all away because they're not for you. So it's like somebody had a little copier and was copying all the postcards that were getting sent to the uh, post office and putting them in everybody's box. Hubs are nasty. Don't do hubs. If you have hubs in your, uh, in your home network, convince the budget committee that you have to replace them. <coughs> Does anyone here have power line cable? Okay, cool. Does anyone, has anyone had their power meter switched out lately for a, a new power meter? A smart meter? Yeah. I had uh, mine switched out last year. I hate it. Why? It took four months to get my electricity bill right. <laughs> <laughs> their little thing, their thing is now, they don't have to get out of their vehicle to read it. Yeah. So what happened is when they installed it, they programmed it. Well, the problem is they gave my neighbor my number. Oh, great. Well, my number to my neighbor. Well, my neighbor's home 24 7, I swear to God, every year on. And every device in their house, so I'm getting these $250 electricity bills. Oh. And I'm like, well, are you doing it wrong? So they came out and finally, hey, what's going on here? And he goes, well, go turn on your TVs and stuff, see what happens. I had everything on in the house, and my meter never moved. And he's like, what's so going it on? was an address problem. Yes. You had your address wrong. Gotta love digital age. Digital stuff is cool, isn't it? Um, they don't make a mistake. People make mistakes. So now, it used to be that your power system was stupid. It was analog. It gave you three-phase power to your house, 220 volts, three phases. And then your house broke it down and you used one of those phases for every little 120 volt thing. Now the power company is using your power line as a digital network as well. And they eventually are going to have their computers talking to your meter so that they can read your meter um, more conveniently and more error prone apparently. Well it's all human error. They said when they they have special trained technicians, their whole job is to go out and install these things. Uh -huh. When they install them, they're supposed to make sure they document IP addresses and all that. Well, I live in a condo complex where we have 15 or more riser tower. And between Somebody the 12, a between the 12 buildings, there's about 18 of us that were all just he just didn't pay attention to where he yeah. at. Cool. Sorry to hear that. Actually, I don't want to say it. it's cool. But it's nice now. Like it's fifty dollars. Just see, goes down like seventy bucks a month again. Who's bought a refrigerator recently? Nobody. I haven't bought a refrigerator in a long time. These days, your refrigerators are carrying. If you buy an expensive refrigerator, are carrying digital networks in them. And they talk to your power meter. Now, they haven't been advertising this, and it's not clear to me whether PGE in this area, whether it's actually being deployed here. But um, since I'm an old electrical engineer, I still subscribe to a lot of the electrical engineering uh, journals and things. And the power industry, and that is all the major appliance vendors as well, are setting it up so that in those situations where we're running out of power, not only can I tell if I'm a power company, not only can I read your house to see how much power you use, but they're setting up the infrastructure where I can tell your house you need to use less power. And your refrigerator will go into low power mode. Or if it's an extreme situation, if you have an electric stove or something, your electric stove will turn off. Because, you know, it's a real problem when the power grid goes down. You know, if, there's, if it's in the summer, for example, 
and we're using too much power and the power company hasn't planned correctly, brownouts are a bad thing. And I would much rather have my refrigerator calm down and say, you know, don't open me, I'm not working right now, than to have the hospital lose power down the street. But what's crazy is they're not telling us. If you go to Best Buy or Sears and you say, I want to buy the top of the line refrigerator, and that salesman will not tell you, oh, and by the way, this fridge is equipped to talk to your power company and tell it and to respond to uh, throttling commands. They're just, they're not saying that about it. And there was a bit of a scandal a couple of months ago where someone discovered, wow, what's this that my refrigerator is set up to do? And they said, oh, well, most refrigerators these days are being smart enough that if there's a problem, you can shut your refrigerator off. I do it, and the wire. Well, yeah, it's your refrigerator. So it's a real interesting thing. We'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about... Um, so does that mean that they can just turn all of our appliances on full blast to stop us from more energy? I don't know. I really don't know. Are yeah, well, they doing the service attack by turning everything on in the neighborhood? I can see them doing that and saying, oh, well, you still got to pay it. Yeah, right. I worry about it is it's a network, right? So if, um, and companies already do this, if you've got any, any of you guys have ever done any uh, heating and uh, ventilation and air, air conditioning work, a, a building like this is very smart. And it is constantly regulating the temperature in the building and it's, and it's turning on valves and it's routing air to different places. The more modern the building, the more sophisticated it is. And that's all under computer control. This isn't a bad thing. It helps the whole system become more efficient. It helps in the, when it's being used correctly. It helps your power bill go down. The problem is what happens when it's attacked? We'll talk about network attacks next week. What happens when someone who's an enemy of this country or an enemy of you in particular decides that they're going to mess with you and they take over control of all of your physical machines? used to be not much of a problem if all they did was destroy your hard disk or all they did was well, a real problem when they stole your credit card information. But if the appliances in your house, if your heater, if your stove is under computer control and networked, then it's vulnerable. Your stove better have a good firewall, a digital firewall as well as a physical firewall. Because you really don't want someone turning your stove to 600 degrees while you're there. It's just not a good idea. So anyway, this is all a digression from that power line network. Most of us these days, as we talked about on Tuesday, we have a wireless network in our house. So in your, um, let's do a quick sketch of what, a little bit of what my house looks like. So I've got the switch coming in. So my network would have a box for my Linksys router, a box for my cable modem. This switch is a four port switch. Right there at the switch I have a um, I have a PS3 which is an entertainment center. It's where I watch videos and that sort of thing. Then it, I go downstream and I've got another switch. Um, I've got a wireless access point. Coming off the wireless access point is um, phones. There's three of them in our house. Another, this is a lightning bolt. Very poorly drawn lightning bolt. Um, there's laptops. And there's a new iPad, all connected wirelessly. So I need you to show me that your wireless connections are different. They're radio connections, so they use lightning bolts in our diagrams. Please go along. If there's actually a cable, if there's actually a connection, show me a line. Show me a wire that connects the two of them. Um, so excuse me, it's Pardon me? Sideways. A sine wave? Yeah. Alternating for sine wave No, no, these are these are digital connections. These are digital connections. If you've got sine waves on your thing, then you've got one of those power line connections, and you should show me that too. Yes, sir. So with my network, I mean it's very simple. It's a computer and a modem. Uh-huh. That's gonna be a is that 
Do I need to add well, ones to? Well, if you read the assignment carefully, you'll say, I, I want to see a network that has at least these elements in it. I want to see a wireless access point. I want to see a router. I want to see these sort of things. Yeah. If your home network doesn't have one, then there's instructions in the, in the uh, assignment for you to make one up. I've had a student who, who gave me his dream network, who showed me what he would have in his house if he was allowed to. And he had, he had a dozen printers, he had a Cray supercomputer, he had a bunch of stuff. And his network was correct. It, it was a very clear diagram. This is a big network for a home. Is this true when you have at least one wired, wired connection? So could that just be from the cable to the router? Okay. Or does it have so to you, be? In your house, you have all wireless, right? You have no cables? Great. Um, I have, well, I guess you say I have a cable going from the back of the modem router thing that the, my links is still back of the TV. Okay. So I'm looking for the fact that you know what all of these pieces mean. And you can draw me a picture of a network that is a functioning network. Now, if you have a, a, a network that has printers and PCs and laptops and all that, and it just happens to be all wireless, that's cool. Okay. It's going to be tough for you to show me the structure of that network. The point of a diagram is to show me the connections between things. Remember, an entity relationship diagram shows me the connections between entities. This diagram, I want to see the connection between network devices. And I want to see that you understand how some network devices connect to other network devices. Really, nothing more than that. And if you and if you have a home network that isn't very simple, that isn't very complex, then you have to make one up that is a little more complex, so you can get the laundry list of components out on the scene. I know some of you guys have much more complex home networks and probably have a lot more stuff on your home network than I need to, to know about. Uh, like for example, uh, downstream of this switch, there is eight ports off of this switch. This is in my office. There's a bunch of Macs. There's a bunch of Linux boxes. There's uh, printers. Um, and I am chagrined to say that even downstream of this, there's a really old hub <coughs> that has two Linux boxes on it. You know, I, I heard from a really good source that you should probably get rid of that. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's there's a, so embarrassing. There's a nice gigabit switch on Snapchat right now for 20 bucks. Yeah. If I, when I bought this, this was a $90 hub. It tells you an idea of how old it is. So anyway, yes, this is an embarrassment. And frankly, these days, I don't run these devices anymore. And if I need a Linux box, I run it as a virtual machine on, on this machine. These are really old, what they used to call tan boxes, really old tan boxes. They're not worth their effort. So they just, in fact, I turned one of them on in the wintertime primarily to keep that room. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, um, <coughs> then this goes down to another switch. This is my son's network. He has an Xbox. He has a PC. Um, so I've got another switch. Now on your assignment, they're going to want to see, I want to see phones. Um, one of the things coming off of this switch is another wireless access point. And I think the symbol for that looks like an antenna coming out of a cone. This is up in my attic, and in fact, it is upside down so that the pattern radiates downward into my front yard. Because I work from home, and I love to work from a hammock. And the wireless access point that is on this machine just doesn't get there. Also, uh, there's another wireless access point that is on my stereo that connects up to a um, audio interface that connects up to the stereo. And this is all in an Apple uh, Airport Extreme. So you're running those access points from the switch itself and not like trying to do a mesh? No, I tried that for a while and I couldn't get it to be reliable. Stop using airports. <laughs> like I said, this one is failing, so I'm going to throw that away and probably put a Linksys up there. This one is rock solid. I've never asked it to do anything other than just be an audio interface. 
But yeah, this will be my last airport. I got this a is nice a Lexus uh, router here. Asus uh, RT16. Okay. Uh, Wireless set on the 2.4 uh, modern tomato. I think you would love to be able to see what it's for. Tomato? I don't know what a tomato is. It's an incentive to migration. Yeah. Cool. I'd like to learn more. <laughs> Do the wireless access points have their own independent WPA keys for when you go to log on to your yes. website? Yeah, inside this thing, this symbol refers to just the radio. Just the radio. If I were to show you the full guts of this device, it would look exactly like this. I'm just not using any of that functionality. I turned off its DHCP server, I turned off its network address. It's a simple bridge and a radio, and that's all it is. You can't buy just these things for consumers anymore. You can buy them for industrial networks, where you just are putting wireless access points in, you know, across a big building. But this is just an old, an old router that I threw into service when I got a better one for my name. And now that it's failing, it's going to be, you know, thrown away. Yes, sir. Um, or like the notebooks, do you like want the model of the notebook or just notebook? No. The thing about a network interface is I want to know what's the functionality and what's the bandwidth. So these are this is a hundred. Again, it's been a while since I've upgraded my switches. This is a 100 megabit switch. This is a 100 megabit switch. And to my utter shame, this is a 10 megabit hub. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of those guys, I own cars for 10 years. This uh, thing, this thing is probably a dozen years old. Right. I'm not going to think about it. As long as it's still shipping packets, I don't. So that's the essential thing. I don't care what kind of laptops you've got. I want to know that you've got a phone. I want to know that it's talking to, if you are talking, if your phone has a wireless interface, I want to see that it's connected to your wireless access. So like with multiple laptops, do I just need to do like one connection, you know, like wireless connection to say laptops? Or like three laptops? Or that's a great point. Because one of the things you want to show in a network diagram is it's how many devices do I have to support? Okay, so I could just put like three laptops, three phones? Yeah. Okay. Uh, or you can put all of them, you can actually show me all three laptops. But if you're supporting <coughs> three laptops in your home network, I'd also like to know is it 802.11b? 80, 80, is it 802.11g? Is it 802.11b? I'd have to look it up. It's all of them. It's all of them. Right. Because if you're a network engineer, the thing you're going to do is you're going to graph, just like we do in all of our analysts' uh, uh, jobs, we try and draw a picture of the situation. And in a network diagram, the picture is, where's the data going? What form is it in? And how much of it do I have to ship around? Because this is actually a smaller network than I used to have when I had both guys living at home, and we had machines in every room, and I was doing a lot more work with these machines. I didn't used to have a hub here, I had a switch here. But now we've downgraded, people have moved out, we've got a lot more wireless going on than we used to. The needs of the network have changed. I used to have a, I used to have a actual static IP address and I had a web server in my house. And so, whole different requirement on that network. Well, different setup here. This is actually a, a dynamic address that's assigned to me by Comcast. And I use a DNS service um, called Dynamic DNS. We haven't talked much about uh, we haven't talked much about uh, DNS service, but I used to have a static IP address and I paid for it. Now I don't. I, have a, I do uh, my DNS through Dynamic DNS, and my router keeps them up to date, tells them when Comcast changes my IP address. Do we need to show what you're using that also? No, I don't care. That's not the level that this class operates at. <clears throat> but if you do know your static IP address, show it here. If, these, if you have any static IP addresses in here for whatever reason, oh, show me that. Like these machines, these server machines, I have them all static IP addresses. I don't want their addresses changing because I mess with their programming. 
So if I were doing this, I would say these are static, these are all dynamic, these are all dynamic, because that's part of the configuration of my network. You guys, this is probably the first network diagram you've ever drawn, and hopefully it'll be the second to last one you'll ever have to draw. Don't go too far so now on the lightning bolts. So yeah. I've got an iPad. I can just put a lightning bolt going off there. I don't have to draw the lightning bolt all the way to the access point. I mean, a good diagram should be clear. And I'll kick it back to you if you've got wires crossing or I don't know what's connected to what. Well, like on an iPad. That's why it's funny. So this is the lightning bolt they use to cut us. I'm going to show that right. I'm going to show it. I'm going to show it. And did you do that with one thing? I did. Yeah. One thing left. is a great tool. Any other questions about this assignment? So, um, where you got to figure maybe the communication between the devices, how do we find this? Is it, can you look it up on the internet as far as the specs on the device? Yep. So, let's say you have a, um, let's wait till they finish uh, talking about their exam. So if you have a um, modem, I'd like you to find out what its model number is, and I'd like you to look up, if you still have the manual, let me know what, what's going on inside that modem, how fast is it. If you have a, a router, what they call a router, um, I'd like you to look it up and tell me, does it have a DHCP server in it? Does it have a switch? Let me know what's inside. If you just show me a box and, that's, and you don't label it, I'll kick it back to you. And if you turn it in late, you lose points. And the phone should have that too. I mean, I have a digital phone, and it has a little modem connected to it as well. So it should have some information. Yep. Now, one of the things that I want to see is your cell phone connection is also a digital network connection. And so you'll read in the assignment where there's a cell phone tower. Out here. And let's say this is my phone. So if my, if my bus writes a short, short bus to show a cell phone with a tower outside? Right. I've got a digital connection to my. I've got a digital connection to the cell tower. And this particular phone has some sort of wireless net. has a wireless connection to my home network. Now, I don't, I don't need to see that it also has a Bluetooth connection to my uh, headphones. But it does. If you live in a house where 30 people have Bluetooth headphones, then you've got to start mapping your Bluetooth usage because there's going to be collisions. understand what's connected to what. So I can see how you've got your network set up. So we have to do cell phone. Whether you got a cell phone? Yeah, but then show me what it's connected to. If you read when you read the assignment you'll see that they want to see you out in the yard with you and your cell phone talking to a cell phone. They're not gonna happen. If you have a comp I'll bet you have a pretty complex home network. That'll be fine. If you can show me where your phone connects. If you just have a phone sitting in the middle of the page and, you don't, and it's not connect, connected to anything, I'm going to assume that you have a dead phone and that you can't use it to call anybody. Okay, show me what's going on. And if you have an uncomplicated network like Richard, make something up. Now the other thing that you'll see in the assignment is that... <laughs> They want you to actually draw a house. Yeah. Not gonna happen. <laughs> well, I would recommend, again, I don't need to see the exact 
I don't, I don't need to see your house. I had someone who actually gave me a blueprint of his house <laughs> and showed me where all the wireless access points. Why is it important, especially for a wireless network, why is it important to show the house? Because you have walls in that. Yeah. The whole point of a wireless network is uniform coverage. And if you've ever carried your laptop or your phone around your house, you'll find that there are some places in your house that don't have any coverage. Because they're in a dead zone. They're behind the fridge, or there's some big piece of metal between you and your wireless access point. So it is very important, and on network diagrams, a physical network diagram, you do need to show a blueprint of the facility that you're installing the network in. Who's of you worked as an electrical contractor? Anyone done that? Well, if you've ever looked at a house set of plans, they don't just show you a, the electrical diagram. They show you where the wires are in the house. And especially for wireless networks, it's really important to show what's in the house and where it is. Like I said, I have a wireless access point up here. And I also have one down here. Because I want to have uniform coverage. So if I live in a flat, I really don't want to cover the whole house. Since it's an introductory course and we're only spending two weeks on this, there's a good deal of latitude. But as all assignments, this is written pretty explicitly. I want to see this, I want to see this, I want to see that. Because, like, I don't have any wired. I guess you could say my TV's wired to the remote. Yep. So if you live in a, a, a condo and it's a relatively small space and you get good coverage everywhere, that's fine. If you live in a mansion and you've got 13 wireless yeah, access yeah. points and they're, they're all part of a wireless mesh because you can't get decent wireless in the servants' quarters, I want to see that. You know, the whole thing. All right, let's take a break. And then we'll shift gears, and we'll talk about forms.